Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'll talk about the economy today, and I know that many of you guys have uh, had uh, coursework or had have studied the, the studied economics. So I want to introduce immediately, though, some terminology that may not be familiar to the uh, normal economist, and that, that's emergence. We've heard a little bit about the idea of emergence today, uh, and the basic idea I want to get across is that uh, uh, I want to think about emergence in terms of uh, aggregate behavior arising from uh, s relatively simple component behavior. Now, what you're seeing here is a simple uh, agent-based model running where the red dots are trying to harvest the yellow stuff uh, that, they, that they see around them. Uh, the, the top uh, slide, which is meant to be only uh, you know, notionally related to the bottom one, is our, our gold uh, miners in Brazil and uh, uh, scurrying over one another trying to find the, find the things they care about. Uh, it's, it's generally hard to do this. It's hard to go from micro to macro. And so there are some simplifications that uh, we, we've all come to know and love in the, in the sciences. One is, how do physicists do this? Physicists assume that uh, the components have some simple properties, so you can do statistical mechanics. And in economics, it's more, much more common to say, well, we know that the individuals are complicated, so are complex, so we can't do that, so let's assume there's only a, a representative agent. And what I'm gonna talk about today primarily is gonna be uh, kind of the opposite assumption. We're gonna let, uh, let there be full-blown heterogeneity, full-blown uh, complex behavior at the individual level, and we'll see how that manifests itself using computational techniques. And the reason why this is important, uh, the reason why the representative agent is really unsatisfactory, I think, in many, many ways, is that uh, uh, we have the fallacy of composition. That is, if we know how the individual behaves, it's hard to know how the macroscopic behaves. And the, the famous example is Keynes, the paradox of thrift, right? If, if we're in a recession, all of us should be thrifty in our own household. But then that makes the economy smaller overall. Uh, that's not good for the economy. At least this, is the, this was, the, was the claim of Keynes, uh, be a nice uh, thing to test uh, in a, with a computational model. Another way to say this is the physics way, more is different, more can be different. Uh, and Herb Simon uh, basically said, uh, you know, look, we're, we're, all re we're all reductionists in some sense. We all learn science. We all try to break the, break the thing into its pieces and go from there. But in fact, pragmatically, we're anti-reductionists. We, we know we can't do this pro solve this problem easily, so we, in fact, uh, uh, have to uh, do other things. What, what are some other things we do? Well, I want to contrast uh, uh, on a caricature, as it were, uh, the simple uh, uh, social science that we grew up with, that many of us went to graduate school in the last century uh, learned, versus uh, what we might call 21st century social science. And think about the fact that we, uh, we've, we thought about uh, global price vectors in the, in the old models, and uh, people were rational. Behavior has taught us that that's not, that's not true anymore. There was, a, the head of the firm is a single decision maker who tries to maximize profits, say. And then we have uh, well-mixed averages, uh, uh, variances finite in these, these systems, and we solve for equilibrium. This is Nash equilibrium, Valray's equilibrium. You know, this is, a, this is the, uh, the, you know, the main thrust of the of journal articles in economics. And, uh, there's one price that obtains in the whole market. Now compare this with, uh, with what we do today, which is to say we, uh, that uh, information is highly localized. Uh, I, I do live in McLean, Virginia, just a few blocks from a, from a, a three-letter government agency which actually has central in its, in its name. And uh, they wish this was not true, but in fact, the real world is, much, is full of local information, not global information. Uh, today we know that behavioral heuristics matter a lot. That is, uh, people are not fully rational. And uh, if you want to think about uh, institutions, those are really multi-agent institutions. Uh, Congress is not run by a single person. Right? The Speaker of the House does not run Congress. Right? There's 435 different uh, ideas in, in the House of Representatives alone, another 100 in the Senate. And then instead of having things well mixed, we have heavy tails, we have infinite variance processes. We have a lot of, the world is much more complex than we, when we think about it in, in these terms. Instead of equilibrium, what do we have? We have perpetual adaptation in the financial markets. Nobody's ever in equilibrium. Right? People are always trying to outguess, get, outguess the next guy. So we, not, we want to basically be able to, to do the stuff on the right. Personal prices. Everybody, Everybody who flew to Vermont today, even, well, even if you come from the same city, probably pay different prices for, the, for your airfare, right? And uh, so we want to basically contrast the, the left side is the old way of doing it. It's hard to jump over to do the right side all at once. It's impossible to do it mathematically, so that we can do much of that computationally, and I want to, I want to talk about how we do that. Well, one way to do that is with agent computing. And agent computing, just, uh, for, the, just uh, for background, uh, for those of you who have not seen it too much before, we have a bunch of software objects that interact, and they interact in some you know, non-trivial way. Uh, they're not just particles they're not in a gas, they're not just bouncing off one another. It's actually uh, very easy to write down, for example, behaviorally, uh, uh, experimentally determined rules of behavior, and we can put that into our models. Uh, it turns out it's very easy to parallel, parallelize such codes, and uh, that's an important thing on the modern architectures. There are good software frameworks for doing this today. I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later on, I think. Uh, and we have had some several recent successes in using these agent-based models for policy purposes, pedestrian flow epidemiology, and combat model. Now, the, the animation that you're seeing up here on the right is basically a supply and demand picture for the, 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 sh the simple sugarscape world that I showed in the previous uh, a couple slides ago. And the, the dot that's bouncing around is where people are actually trading versus what the supply and demand picture says they should trade at. And you see an obvious discrepancy there. And we can use the agent-based models to, 
to, uh, to, to determine whether, in fact, the uh, mathematical analytical prediction looks like what happens in, the, in, in the, say, a distributed decentralized world, yes or no. Over the last couple uh, decades, we've had great uh, advances in uh, hardware, as everyone knows. And so I'm going to do a little calculation here. You saw a couple, couple hundred agents running around on the previous, uh, in the previ uh, couple of slides ago on that SugarScape model. Well, if we're getting a uh, 2x two, two increase in hardware every 18 months, uh, the original SugarScape model was built way back in 1992. Okay, that's 20 years ago. So we've had that guy written 13 doubling times since then. Two to the 13th is 10,000. What does that give you? It gives you, and hopefully you can see this, this is SugarScape uh, with one million agents uh, to give you a sense of the scale as possible. It's a little bit hard to see it, I think, on, the, with this, on this projector, but uh, the main point to say is that, we're, and of course, in this case, we're spending lots of clock cycles just, just on the graphical rendering. And uh, what we want to do is uh, basically uh, have uh, put this number or more agents into artificial, or to models of artificial economies. All right? So that we can turn off the graphics and get some, get some more, uh, more, more clock cycles available to us as well. So the idea is that we can uh, build uh, large-scale models, as you're seeing here, uh, much larger than the simple ones that we saw at the, at the, at the start. All right? Okay, so what can we do with this, uh, with all this, uh, all this computing technology? An early ex example of what, what, what might be possible was, uh, uh, is this a book called a NASDAQ Simulation by Darley and Outkin. Uh, the NASDAQ, if some of you remember, 10 years ago traded an ace and sixteenths of a dollar, and uh, SEC uh, required that the, the NASDAQ decimalize the market. Now, SEC made this demand not for reasons of, uh, of market efficiency or some other uh, reasons of, kind of say, model pro market performance, but, but for reasons of, uh, of social norms. That is, uh, other markets were traded in decimals, the NASDAQ should too. The NASDAQ was just coming off a lawsuit, it's a long story about that, but suffice it to say, uh, in fact, it was not SEC, but it was the NASDAQ management themselves that wanted to find out what would be the effect of decimalization. And so what they did is, they hired a company to build a, 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 a model of this. In fact, it was Stu Kaufman, well known to Vermonters, I think, uh, who, uh, who, who was involved with this. And, uh, uh, they built a model with evolutionary agents and were able to make in this lower box here, it says they predicted that there would be several effects and uh, they got most of, the, most, of the, uh, most of the predictions came out to be right. That is, they made uh, projections or forecasts about what would be the effect on volatility, price formation, price discovery, all these things. And they, in this book, they, they, they describe how these things uh, either were or were not uh, you know, uh, borne out when the market was decimalized. So this is an early example. I'll come back at the end to ask, why is it, isn't it the case that, in fact, uh, the SEC in, uh, has a, uh, builds this kind of model and uh, to help better understand how their own market uh, that they regulate works? So against this background of knowing that these kinds of models are possible and knowing we're having all this great capacity, I've been involved for the last couple of years in building what we today call the mass macro model. Multi-agent system is, the, is, the, is the, uh, what MAS stands for. And now the holy grail of macro, macroeconomics of the last generation really has been, what are the micro foundations? Can we write down individual foundations for macro? As opposed to, for example, the old Keynesian model did not have any micro foundations. So uh, the, the, the reigning uh, way to do this is what's called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, DSGE models. And in these DSGE models, basically, you assume that the microscopic, the agent level, is in equilibrium. And then the only way that you can have dynamics in the model is to force that thing from the outside. You're gonna shock it. You're gonna put outside shocks to, you know, uh, uh, news, news streams coming in and, and uh, maybe certain prices, petroleum prices get, uh, get influenced or something. Uh, and then there's no financial sector in this model. I'll come back to the implications of that uh, later on. But now a different methodology than what I'll describe today, at least notionally, I'll describe the idea of we can today build 150 million agent models and, uh, and this is roughly the size of the U.S. economy. Okay, so 150 million workers, uh, depending on what the unemployment rate is, is uh, roughly uh, where the U.S. economy lives today. Uh, and now, as opposed to having rational agents in there who are always doing what's, you know, what's optimal, we, we, we instead have purposive agents who are, we have firms that are adaptive instead of necessarily being profit maximizing. The prices and wages are determined locally instead of having one price vector that clears all markets. So it's a different modeling approach, a different modeling philosophy. Uh, and then back to this word emergent. Uh, the kinds of things that come out of these models, we don't write down, we don't pre-specify what can happen, rather we just let that boil up, uh, percolate up from, from below and we, uh, and we, uh, we see, what, see what that is. Now here's just some examples of, of some things that, can, that go on in these models. This is an example of, of the firm size uh, aspects of the model. What you're seeing in the, in the animation here are little dots of forming firms, forming little proto-firms. You can see the model runs slowly when the graphics are, are, are turned on. 
Uh, but this model written at one-to-one -one scale with the US, it turns out there are actually many robust patterns uh, in these financial data. We think about social science data as being noisy. We think about social science data being messy. What you're seeing here in the lower right is a plot of how many firms are there, vertical axis, of what size, horizontal axis, from having one employee to having one million employees. The single observation at the upper end is, is Walmart, circa 1997. Uh, and, and then the, basically there are one, there's one firm with a million employees. There are a million firms with one employee. And there's almost a perfectly smooth distribution between, between there. Okay? Uh, and by the way, this is not a sample of data. This is, uh, this is from, this, from the census, which gets the data from IRS. And IRS assures me that, in fact, if you know of some, any companies that are not in this sample, you should uh, let them know. Okay? So, uh, so we, there, this is an example of the kind of pattern we'd like to hit. And what, what's a little bit hard to see, but, but what I'll show later on, I think, is that, uh, is that uh, what you're seeing is that in this model of firm formation, there, are, there is, in fact, at any given time, you know, one or two large firms, a few medium-sized ones, and lots of small firms. And that's, that's what, the, what we're showing about this power law here. Okay, so the model, this, this model, in fact, reproduces the distribution of firm sizes about right, distribution of firm growth rates, distribution of firm lifetimes, job tenure distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so we, can, we have some sense that underlying the, or inside the guts of the model is doing things that, that, that we believe are accurate. Uh, and then uh, just to show us now some time series for the model. But the main thing, I think the main thing from the point of view of macroeconomics is that we get output fluctuations in these models. Even though they're rendered at, with 150 million agents, you might think that the law of large numbers would, would guarantee you to wash out all dynamics. The law of large numbers would kind of cause everything to be kind of just, uh, just, uh, just, uh, be, just, e just equilibrate and nothing of interest would happen. But what this shows is that there are, in fact, significant, in this case, on the order of you know, 5 to 10% fluctuations that happen on, happen on a regular basis. Partially because in, the number of firms is changing over time. Firms enter markets, firms leave markets based on the, on, on the opportunities that, that they find in those, in those uh, markets. And uh, overall, that generates lots of fluctuations. So the main thing to think about, the main way this is different from conventional macro is that we're, gonna, we're not going to have to shock the model. We're going to basically say we can just let the model produce its own endogenous dynamics. And that's very different in character from what, uh, what we have be coming before us. Now, it turns out that um, uh, a different large-scale model that, that we've been working on recently with the funding from uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking and working with many collaborators from, uh, George Ma from Yale, Brown, and Santa Fe, along with George Mason graduate students, uh, is a model of the housing market bubble. Uh, so here I'm showing there's just data on what, what is a typical, if you normalize prices to say that, uh, around the year 2000 at 100, this is Washington, D.C., disaggregated by a few different counties. Uh, so some counties had a little bit more, some a little bit less, but you see basically a factor of two to two and a half price increase over the, over the six or seven years leading up to the bubble uh, bursting. So this is a model where uh, we, we will attempt to render it at scale. At scale means there are 50 million mortgage holders in the U.S. It turns out that as a practical matter today, one, one quarter of them are in fact underwater, meaning that they, the face value of the loan is more than what the value of the house is ostensibly. Uh, so there are many causes for the housing bubble uh, that have been offered. You've, you've heard of all these things. It was the Fed's fault, right? Fannie and Freddie did it. Uh, maybe it was all these complex uh, uh, derivatives that Peter alluded to earlier that, uh, that, that, that mattered, the CDOs, the, the CIVs, and the mortgage-backed securities. Uh, it could also be that these, there are new kinds of mortgages. Uh, maybe that was it, interest-only mortgages and all this other stuff, right? Uh, maybe it was just the animal spirits, and that's one, that's one uh, there's a book about that, right? Well, it turns out that uh, uh, we, are, we have teamed with a mortgage data provider. They're providing us 45 million, rec million records a month. Basically, whenever you send in your, your mortgage payment every month, we're, we're getting data on you. Actually, it turns out anonymized, but, uh, but we're getting, we have access to those data. And uh, uh, it turns out that we have, a, we have a model which currently does get a bubble, and we're, we're in the process of ex extending that to the U.S., and uh, that, that's work that should be coming out in early 2012. And one cool thing to do is to say, what if, in fact, the Fed had acted differently? What if, in fact, Fannie and Freddie had done things differently? Could we, would, would the bubble have been severe? And we will have something to say about that uh, next year. Uh, but uh, at, at the moment, we are uh, still studying the, the model. Now, this, this piece of, of the, of this, this model is just is one aspect of a wider model that we hope to build, a model of the entire crisis. How does, in fact, the uh, housing market bubble manifests itself in, uh, in, in the real economy with a, a giant jump in unemployment rates that we saw in the course of the crisis from 5% to 10%. In fact, the Fed staff properly guessed what the price drop would be, and they said, well, using our best model, Furbis, what's going to happen to unemployment? And the answer was, it'll go from 5% to 5.5%. It went to 10%, so they're off by a large factor there, and, that, that was, and that's because these conventional models don't have things like the financial sector in there. And so we need to have a model where there, with all these, all these components, workers, firms, consumers, borrowers, bankers, lenders, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to just having some reduced form regression of all these stuff. And so 
Uh, we hope to have such a model. There's a project starting now on this, and we hope to have some results on this in a, within a year or two. Uh, okay, so uh, the last point I want to make is that um, when we think about the crisis, we think about uh, building these computational models, we think about doing big data, big, 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 uh, big computing. Uh, we need to have resources to, to do this, and so I just want to make a point about uh, how, much, uh, how much do we spend on research in the U.S. in a given year. So math physics, we know 1.5 billion. We spend about a billion dollars a year on ocean polar basic research. It turns out the whole social behavioral side of NSF is about $100 million, and some of you will know the econ side is $30 million, okay? So economics, well, the economics, apart from macro and finance, about $5 million a year. Uh, what was the size of the crisis? Two trillion, maybe 20 trillion, depending on how you, how you, how you. so I just I invite you to think about how, how ineffective must macro research be to justify that kind of a cost-benefit ratio, okay? <laughs> I'll just leave you with that. So the summary is that uh, uh, this is a new way to do economics, uh, artificial economies of adaptive agents. You can do 100 million agents today. You can calibrate it with big data. The macrostructure emerges. We don't pre-specify it. And uh, we can develop these counterfactual models for public policy. We need a major research effort, I think, in this area to get us out of the current mess and to avoid future crises. Thank you very much.